it was my very first time on an expedition with a group of researchers. So I was kind of cocky and I said, ah, I'll be fine. Well, in the middle of the night, I'm lying there in the hammock and suddenly I'm like, crack. And I'm like, oh, and I hear, I hear walking, like crunching on the sticks, walking towards me. And I could feel the vibration of each step off of the hammock. And I'm standing there really still, like going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. A Kodega is a guide and a storyteller escorting you through the night lighting the way, warding off thieves, ghosts, demons, and other oddities. Along the journey, his companions would often share with him the most curious of stories that he'd record in his codex. Perhaps you just might find yourself traveling with the Codega and sharing one of yours. Click that like. Yeah. If you're new here, subscribe and have the bell hit for notifications to stay up to date on all the new content. Hello, everyone. It's Ra here, your guide on Codega's Codex of Curiosities. And tonight we're going to take a bit of an adventure with some Bigfoot, uh, maybe some paranormal, but definitely we're going to delve into the world of Sasquatch. So with that being said, just a reminder, every Tuesday we're dropping audio Every Thursday is the video. Also, um, every now and then on Sundays, I'll be releasing some bonus videos, and that's only on YouTube. So if, you, uh, if you're just listening, go check out the YouTube channel. Um, it's taken off really, uh, really hot, and I'm really proud to say, you know, uh, you know it's doing really well. And I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, and how you can help me on this one is always make sure you share the channel, share the show, like it, comment. Do what you do. All right. With that being said, I uh, I also want to say, you know, um, if you're interested in any merch, I got some. You should check out the merch store, which will be down below. I'm not going to waste your time in showing you my advertisement. Maybe we'll do that at the end of the show. But uh, I think I should jump right in and bring Jason uh, Kenzie on. He is our guest tonight. He has made countless documentaries about Sasquatch. And he started making some documentaries on the paranormal as well, as well. So without further ado, let's bring Jason to the stage. Hello. Hi, Hi Jason. How, how you doing? And welcome to Codega's Codex of Curiosities. I'm very good. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you. You know, we set this up a while ago and uh, I've been looking forward to this. So for, for my listeners and viewers who maybe aren't acquainted with you, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself and where they can find you? Okay, so I am I'm trained as a animal photojournalist. Okay. For 25 years, I've traveled the world meeting people that live with the most amazing animals. Uh, so I would meet people that had pet wolves, pet bobcats, tigers, grizzly bears, uh, zebras, monkeys, you name it, and everything in between. And I started as a photographer and then moved into doing video because nobody believed me when I told them that I was gonna go and take photos of a guy with a pet <coughs> caiman in his homemade bathtub. And so that started doing a video of behind the scenes of what I call my animal adventures, which is another web series that I, I started years ago and up to 400 short little uh, behind the scenes of my animal photo shoots so okay. you get to see how much fun and then i moved into the paranormal uh the sasquatch uh, when the world was locked down from from covid 
I actually was driving myself crazy because I didn't have nothing to do. I couldn't travel. I couldn't go out of state. So I, uh, somebody said to me, hey, why don't you just do Sasquatch? And I am a skeptic when it came to Sasquatch. So I was like, no, that sounds stupid. Those creatures aren't real. And so my friend pointed me to a, a person who had an encounter with one of these creatures. And so I went and interviewed them. I found it quite fascinating. And then I decided, and then they sent me to someone else. Uh, and then I decided to film them and have myself asking them questions. And in turn, they told me their Bigfoot story, their encounter. And they sent me to the First Nations people here in British Columbia. And they told me their stories about the Sasquatch people. And so I was so intrigued that they uh, sent me to an area where I traveled deep into the forest and I found hundreds of these giant footprints that went right through a mountain lake. And I was standing on the edge of the lake looking at these huge footprints. And I took a drone with me, so I put it in the air and I droned the lake and you could see all these footprints. That, and I knew they weren't squirrel, right? Because, you know, tiny, big. And so <laughs> from there, I showed the footage to uh, the First Nations people and they told me that they, that I had found the migration path of the Sasquatch people that went from Alaska all the way down to California. And I also found like trees that were ripped out of the ground, moved and then turned upside down and rammed into the ground. Uh, tons of, of tree breaks and tons of uh, tree structures, like giant axes. Mm -hmm. One tree is pushed over and then another tree is ripped out of the ground and moved over and formed into an axe. I, I, before we go too far on that one, what is the significance? Do you have any idea what the significance of those X's are? You know, I honestly can't tell you. I I have my own theories. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Bigfoot has a fascination with playing X and O's. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> honestly, I, I don't know. Researchers tell me that they believe it's a an X, like don't cross. Okay, okay. This is my territory. Uh, either they're showing it to us humans or they're mm -hmm. showing it to other Sasquatch people. Uh, a lot of times the, these axes are no more than like 30 feet or 40 feet just off a trail. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because they sometimes they have a big, uh, like a big tree that's on top of the X. And so when I was in the, the UP of uh, Michigan, yeah, I actually, we, we found a, a giant tree X and I decided that I would spend the night on a hammock just underneath the tree X. And everyone was like, you're crazy. You know, this means don't cross, you know, you're going to piss them off. And so me, it was my very first time on an expedition with a group of researchers. So I was kind of cocky and I said, ah, I'll be fine. But in the middle <laughs> of the night, I'm lying there in the hammock and suddenly I'm like, crack. And I'm like, oh, and I hear, I hear walking, like crunching on the sticks, walking towards me. And I could feel the vibration of each step off of the hammock. And I'm standing there really still, like going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what the hell is that? And all of a sudden it stopped, like I would say it stopped like 10 or 15 feet from me and it grunted in my, my ear. And it scared me so bad that I started, I, I started shaking uncontrollably and I'm trying to hold myself because I'm thinking, is it a, a pig, a, a bear? Like what if it is a big, big foot? I, it could just grab me up. I'm already wrapped up. I'm like a, a burrito. It could just put me over his back and just, you know, walk me into the forest. And then, you know, and, I, and that would be terrible because I had just bought a brand new shirt and I didn't want to get ripped. <laughs> and I didn't want it to smell like a Sasquatch. So I was yeah, like, exactly. This is my new, my new clothes, my new getup. Come on. So it turned and it walked away 
and I could feel it. Every the vibration was crazy, and when it grunted, I could feel the vibration go through me, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And as it walked away, I yelled out because I was with another researcher by the name of uh, uh, Dave Dominique, and I'm like, "Dave, Dave, is that you?" And then a minute later, "Yeah, Jay, what what's happening? What I'm, I'm over here," and I'm, I I unzip really fast, and I get out of my hammock tent and I walked around and there he is 20 feet away bundled up tightly bundled up by a tree I'm like was that you that was just walking around it's like no Jay I was sleeping he woke me up when he yelled my name I'm like are you fucking kidding me are you fucking kidding me no and so uh, we looked around for footprints we couldn't find anything uh, I mean it was so the, 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 the ground was quite hard and it had a lot of leaves so when I went back to everyone else that was there and I told them what happened, everyone's like, wow, that's, that's, that's quite interesting. And, but I felt like people thought that maybe I was making it up because it was my first time. And, you know, I was I just in my head, I was insecure. I was thinking they were all like, hi, ah, first time out. And he had this experience. He's lying. <laughs> one of the researchers went out there the night, the next night, to retrieve something and as he was in there something in the darkness grunted at him it scared him so bad that he he, he kind of quickly because we were on about maybe about i don't know 30 yards from where i was that were across the trail okay and he said look guys jason jason wasn't kidding he, something just grunted at me from the darkness i'm not going back there wow yeah yeah so i filmed all of that and it's yeah. in searching for sasquatch three and four the, the best thing about being a filmmaker is i have my camera going yeah you know but of course i've always you know some of the i can't say some of the best stuff i didn't capture because my camera wasn't rolling but sometimes that does happen because you can only roll for so you know, long. You might be sleeping and not expecting anything to be, you know, coming up on you and grunting at you. Yes. Yeah, my camera is like next to my ear. So in case something happens, I can quickly grab it. And try that, and that's a great idea. Now, so you started off as a skeptic, but, you know, you fell right into this. You know, you just, uh, you, you, I don't know, you, you just been blindsided by all this evidence, which is amazing. Yeah, well, when I first started, I was a 20% believer. Okay. After yeah. 14 Searching for Sasquatch documentaries yeah. and some of the crazy stuff that I've actually captured on film <coughs> and that I've seen, I am about 50% a believer, 50-50. And the only reason why I'm 50-50 and not 100% is because I can't count. No, just kidding. No. <laughs> it's because I haven't had a like a, a daytime sighting, like a class okay. A sighting up front. Yeah. Uh, in one of the documentaries, I actually felt, I walked around, I, I left everyone. Mm -hmm. and I walked around some bushes and right in front of me, 25 feet away in the dark, there was a pair of eyes looking at me and I just froze and I pushed record on my, my uh, video camera and there was a, a half a second or a delay and in that half a second, it dropped to the ground and it just looked at me from behind the trees. And I'm just standing there kind of shaking. Wow. Going, please, please. I don't want a Bigfoot to come up behind me, you know, like the parents. Like right? everyone yeah, was yeah. saying that we were chasing like a young person, like a young Sasquatch and that okay. the parents were mad. So I'm standing there with something in front of me looking from behind trees like this, thinking that I'm filming a young Bigfoot and that the parents were going to come up behind me and just yeah like tap you on the shoulder like done, excuse right? me yeah <laughs> it's like yeah and, and, and I, 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 I like that you are a skeptic you know you're, you're I, I like that you are like a skeptic where you're like a 50 50 skeptic um until you actually get that full on uh you know daytime sighting which is you know like I, I see a lot of like, and it's it's, and I'm not knocking the other people who are 100% believers who have, you know, next to no experience with it at all. Um, I I think it's good to be skeptical, you know, not 
not to be believing that everything is this or is that, you know, it's, it's come in with some skepticism, you know, and try to rule out things that could be just a wild pig, you know, yeah. or, you know, when you finally break some things down, it, it was something you don't have no idea what it was. Well, yeah. Yeah. And so one of the more incredible, uh, um, Bigfoot experience that, uh, that I've had while doing my investigations and filming my documentaries is searching for Sasquatch 10, uh, okay. which is my most recent uh, Bigfoot documentary. It's called The Minnesota Roars. Ah, and yes. We were given audio uh, of these Bigfoot roars that an older gentleman, uh, First Nations, uh, we were at the Red Lake uh, band mm -hmm. and this older gentleman, he was on, he kept hearing these uh, screams and yells in his backyard and his house, his, his thousands and thousands of acres of, of, of forest. Mm -hmm. And he decided to record one, one night and he captured uh, this scream that was so loud and all these screams of like five or six of these Sasquatch creatures just freaking out and scared him so bad that he didn't, he never went back into the forest. And I don't even think he actually left his house. Really? He didn't tell anyone about what, what happened. He didn't show anyone uh, the tapes for a very long time. And finally, I think it was either his nephew or one of his friends had, he gave him the audio and said do not tell anyone my name mm -hmm. so he gave the audio to the she squatchers because i yep. was out with the she squatchers uh gave it to jen and in turn uh, when we heard the audio we went to the area where these uh, sounds were captured and uh would you like to show of course, uh, of course, of course. So we're, we're going to play in the multiple one first, and then we'll end with the, the last one there. So, and we're going to play it on loop so we can hear it a couple of times, okay? Sure. So in a second, I'll go crazy. This, it almost sounds demonic like you know just like this like a lion mixed with this this it sounds hurt maybe yeah it, it's i had a bad breakup with the dog room. yeah so that one that one that one's really like a woeful cry. Now we're way in the background. That is incredible. Yeah, especially when they all start going. Mm -hmm. and then yeah, I think it's just playing. I think it's just looping again. Okay, so we can play that other one, um, no. and, and let, let's try that other one here. Here we go. So can you imagine being in the forest? See, and here the th here's the thing. Yeah. I've heard that roar before when I was in Texas. When I was in Texas, I was with Todd Parsons. I was with that Bigfoot research team out there. We were, we were investigating on an area um, on the border of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. along the Sabine River, Sabine River. And they went off all around us. There was a guy that I interviewed. He said he shot and possibly killed a Bigfoot. Like the okay. big only maybe, you know, 40 feet from him. And he said that it stopped and it, it, it did this on its fist. And he raised up his gun and he shot it and it fell to the ground. He was so scared he jumped back into the the back into his truck 
and then yeah. we came back the next morning um yeah he said it was gone there was blood all over the ground and there was some tire tracks wow and his uh the funny thing is when he showed up for the mm -hmm. interview when he showed up the entire forest went crazy with roars and howls and screams really and he pulled up he had i don't know whether he got that that he altered his muffler or yeah. he had no muffler uh because his muffler was just think of the loudest muffler yeah and then he had all the windows down and he was blasting think of the most hardcore uh death metal that you okay. can possibly think of yeah where you can't even hear any of the the words but it's just and he showed up with it if the volume went as loud as 10 he yeah. had it 12 and he showed up in the middle of the night and when he showed up and when he turned it off the, the entire area around us lit up with howls and screams and really? yells. and it was the most amazing thing and i'm filming everything yeah yeah and that roar is one of the roars we heard and Jeez. we were we were looking at eye shine yeah in the forest we we actually captured a figure mm -hmm. i can't that stood up and we got that we took a picture of that okay in, in thermal and either wow. it was a bigfoot or mm -hmm. it was a naked farmer that was basically just getting turned on uh, by us uh hiding in the forest <laughs> because whatever was out there did not have any clothes on jesus because i actually took a photo of myself yeah standing and you yeah. could clearly see my clothes your clothes but thank okay. goodness because nobody wants to see me naked <laughs> <laughs> but yeah J so the J place jason sorry to interrupt you yeah. um i made a quick adjustment to that one with the multiple screams i know it was kind of yeah. quieter yeah, i made yeah. an adjustment I, I i said let's play it again okay. it's going to be lo much louder now perfect Maybe it's giving birth. Right? Like it and then when it gives birth, that's everyone's cheering. <laughs> like I sure hope your listeners like this. Yeah. That there is, is terrifying, actually, that one. You can almost feel it. Woeful one in the oh, back. And there's, there's no coyotes. So in Texas, when we were getting everything was going crazy around us like that, mm -hmm. uh, not quite like that, but it was more howling and stuff. The coyotes were also howling. And I loved it because I could tell the difference between the coyote howls yep. and whatever the other creatures were. That were howling so for me that was great because on camera i could tell the listener like the people watching that is a coyote yes this is uh searching for sasquatch five the texas screams it's one of my favorite ones so for all you guys want to have some fun and what listen just uh, and watch uh you know and definitely the sasquatch uh what, what, what is it the texas screams the texas screams okay yes um, uh, but yeah, that's yeah. A crazy audio. Like, like, like you can hear the crickets in the background. You know, you can hear you can hear that other noise. Um, yeah, that that's that whatever it is, it's it's intense. It is yeah. very intense. And imagine that being, you know, you're sitting in your house, you're sitting on the back porch, and that's going on. Yeah. And and how often did he say that that was happening? You would hear it all the time. Jeez. But that was the one that really scared him most. most. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've been out in the field quite a few times and we were screamed. Well, actually we were, there was a howl or there was something that threw something uh, or they pushed over a tree and my camera, my camera person would run and I would chase them. 
because they're holding my camera. So I was yeah. being selfish. <laughs> I'm like, give me my camera. And then, okay, fine. Now you can run. Because yeah. where are you going to go? Because we're in the middle of the forest. And if these creatures want to kill us, they're just going to walk up, grab us, twist our heads off. And, and, and if you can hear them over there, it's because they want you to hear them over there. So that's the, that's the other thing that I, through my research, mm -hmm. I found, like, so people ask me, like, so why do they scream? Why do they howl? Because here's the thing. We're sitting around a campfire. If they literally did not make a sound, we would not know that they're there. Yeah. But yet we have sat around a campfire and they can howl right next to us. Like, and then one would howl there, and then the other one would howl like on the other side of us. And then the coyotes would start. And you, you could, yeah, you could definitely tell the difference um, between the, the, the coyotes and, and, um, and these other creatures. I mean, I shouldn't say that 100% because, yeah. you know, obviously coyotes have such a high range of different vocals. They, they, they do. I, I, I grew up in, in Canada as well, in Alberta, on the prairies, and I've heard coyotes howling all my life kind of thing. And yeah, uh, yeah you, you become quite accustomed to uh, to their sounds. So when you listen to that, that one audio with all of them, you mm -hmm. don't really hear the coyotes because nope. coyotes do a bit of a bark. They do yep, a little, yep. like a little, bark, 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 bark. they do it. Yeah, they always yep. have, where whatever they are, they go straight into it. Yes. It's not even a, woo, like us humans, when anytime we do a howl ourselves, it's almost impossible for us to actually go right into it. Mm. Right? Yeah. And unless, yeah. even when you go, ah, right, it, you still <laughs> wreck your voice. That's what you do. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? We always start. And, 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 and that level, though, of those sounds is very very deep and very intense and strong it's i i i don't i i wouldn't be able to do it I, I would not be able to do that yeah well have you been in the field when they yell or scream at you i have not i have not yeah it can be terrifying like when you I, watch I, my I documentaries you'll see that you know i will start joking and some people think it's disrespectful but the fact is i'm scared or extremely nervous and so when i start joking it calms me down and it's yeah. just a go-to, you know, I just kind of just, you know, cause it can be terrifying. I, I can totally relate. You know, it's like, I'll start making jokes at the, you know, at times you're like, why are you joking? And it's like, that's my outlet. You know, it's like, yeah, I I'm, I'm not doing good. I need to make some jokes. I got to make uh make light of the situation as best as possible. Yeah, exactly. You know, but you know, I have a lot of fun. And one of the biggest things about uh, doing my, searching for Sasquatch documentaries is the new friends that I've met mm -hmm. while doing this. Like I have, I've met some new friends that I will pretty much have for the rest of my life. That's fantastic. And I, I made them just researching, uh, you know, Sasquatch. I mean, who knew that the first searching for Sasquatch documentary would, you know, take me, you know, to where I am now. And I'm not done yet. I have five Bigfoot documentaries that I'm filming in the next four awesome. months. Wow. It, it, yeah, that, that is amazing. And, and that is that taking you all over yeah. Canada and the U.S. as well? It's taking me all over North America. To be honest, the Canadian, Canada hasn't, they haven't really supported me as much as the Americans have. Mm -hmm. Like I get more... I don't know it's hard to explain, but for some reason the Canadians don't. I don't know what it is. They don't just fully embrace it. As help much. out your fellow Canadians with anything, especially in the entertainment world, right? They, it, I don't know what true. it is. Maybe. It is true. But the United the Americans they're just so open open arms and they try mm -hmm. and help you and they yeah they're just I don't know what it is with Canada. I just don't understand. I mean. Yeah, it's it's a weird one, but it, I had that my entire life, and I've heard it for so many other people. Yeah, right. They say go to Toronto, that's where they want to. That, that's where Canadians will support you. But guess what? Toronto 
is very Americanized, believe it or it's not. True. Yeah. Right yeah. out of all of Canada, you know, I, I get so much support from Britain. From really? England. Yeah. yeah. From England, they they support what I do and they they help me out and. What about Vancouver? I, w I would think Vancouver, you're, yeah. you know, really. No, Vancouver is pretty much the worst place to try and get anywhere in the entertainment world. And I will say that again for anyone who's listening to me in Vancouver. Vancouver, if you are trying to come to Vancouver to try and make it big in the entertainment world, mm -hmm. <laughs> good luck. Because Vancouver is literally the worst place to try and get anywhere in the entertainment world interesting yeah that's not that's, you can i would not have, have guessed that you know like i've been out of canada for a bit now but uh i would have my assumption was vancouver would be a good place to go no. but no no everyone calls it hollywood north but what they don't get told is pretty much 70 percent of of all the um all the production is yep. from the United States coming up here because of the tax break. Okay, yeah. Seventy percent of the people that are in the entertainment world are uh, from the United States. I uh, mean, Canada's law says that they have to, they have to have parts for Canadians. Mm -hmm. but no one, no one that's anyone, anybody that's anyone in the entertainment world in Vancouver, they don't try and help out the small guy. No. Because for some reason they don't believe in us, they don't believe they don't they don't want to put their money into the small guy. I mean, mm -hmm. they wait till you get very successful, and then they put their money into you. But they don't just go, hey, you know, this this person here is uh, well, not bad. You know what? They only have uh, you know two thousand followers. <laughs> I don't even look at them. Yeah, yeah. like you're not worthy yet which is ridiculous like like oh you got potential but you're not you haven't hit the you know the the members bar mark yet so sorry which is ridiculous you know it's like why not support the smaller ones and help them you know to yeah, uh, yeah exactly but good. you know what i decided to do it myself mm -hmm. so that's another tip for everyone out there that wants to get into you know anyone out there that wants to be an actor or get into the entertainment world literally do not wait for someone to help you do it yourself learn how to do it and do it yourself and try and be good at it one day i'll be good at what i do I, i'm waiting for that day till i'm good at what i do yeah uh, i i and and i completely completely concur with you on this one you know it's kind of like like the way I've been doing it is just doing it myself, you know, just, you know, climbing that ladder myself. And it's, it's, you know, it, I guess it is fulfilling in a way, you know, it's uh, you, what, what you put in, you're going to get out yourself then as well. So are you, are you Canadian? Yep. Oh, yes. you are. Well, guess what? I support you. <laughs> I support you Hello, too. Yes. We'll support you. I will, yes. I will stand beside you. I will help you as much as I, if possible, whatever I can do, I will, I will, I will try. Awesome. I appreciate that, Jason. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm a Burton born and raised in Edmonton and, uh, Edmonton and Calgary. Have you ever lived in Vancouver? Uh, no, I lived in the Okanagan though for about four years. Okanagan. So that's close to Vancouver. I'm sorry. I can't support you anymore. No, <laughs> no. Once so close <laughs> to Vancouver, you ruined it. I, I moved back to Alberta. I was there for about four years and I, and I, I, I encountered a culture uh, and, you know, I made some great friends in the Okanagan. I'm not going to deny that. But I found it was like, if you're not from there, you're not going to make it there. And, oh. and may, maybe that's kind of uh, like that mentality was was very evident when I was there. And I ended up, you know, moving back to, to Calgary and, and doing well in Calgary. Yeah, that's great. You know, yeah. it's funny because I'm about to uh, uh, go out to Merritt. Merit BC. Okay. Yep. yep. Because there's a, a few people out there that just recently have had, they've been hearing extremely strange screams and, and howls in their backyards uh, in, in the forest behind their houses. So I'm interested to check out and, and go to Merit and that would and, be, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I, you know, and, and I would say that when I really got into this, 
is when I moved to Mexico. So I, I kind of missed some chances. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I've, I have experiences in, in Alberta, you know, back in Canada. But when I really started diving into this is when I moved to, to Mexico. And speaking of that, um, you said, have you been down to Mexico and, and done any investigations down here? Or have you just been in uh, Canada and the U.S.? So I have some extreme adventures that I've done in Mexico. And oh, I, before wow. I tell you them, yeah. do you speak? The my, my Spanish is, I can get by. I will say I can get by. I'm not fluent, but I can get by. Do you have friends in Mexico, like actual uh, um, locals? Because I wouldn't mind coming back to Mexico. So I know Mexico, they do have their own lore. Yes, uh, my my well, wife is Mexican. Her and, and she speaks perfect English. Uh, my brother in law, and she worked in tourism as well. Um, my my sister in law works with. Um, archaeological sites you know she's kind of connected with uh with that as well so i do have some connections here so that would be great I, we'll have to talk later Definitely. i would love because I'm, I'm going to be going into other cryptids okay like the flying dinosaurs of new mexico oh wow okay Moth, okay uh mothman uh yeah. i'm going to be looking into um jersey devil be uh, interesting and you know like quite a few of the uh the, uh, the skunk ape and yes basically probably a, a bigfoot like creature anyway just with yeah uh, four 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 toes i think it is i i believe you're correct yes yes the four toes yes. so i went to mexico uh on the border of police oh okay so probably in uh, quintana Roo or something like that or? searching for a I think it was a 30 foot uh crocodile what that the locals said that you know they see all the time so mm -hmm. they asked, so i went deep into the jungles and i i hired, they they put me on a, a small boat and we they took me out uh to this area and i saw lots of big uh caiman i think they're called black black okay uh, but this was a 30 foot black caiman Wow. It all came in. Some, yeah. people, some people don't know, you know, what a Cayman is. Uh, and we went, got to the spot and they were so blown away that it wasn't sitting on the bank where it usually sits all the time. And the the slide was about mm -hmm. five feet. Five wow. feet, like uh, five feet like long. Wide. Yeah, yeah. That's how big the, the slide was. Now, obviously, it could have rolled back and forth and made it much bigger, like bigger. Yeah. But they were so adamant and they were shocked. Uh, I, I took video of other um, uh, black came in that were there that was quite big. And then one of them attacked the boat and then. Really? Yeah. So then it, it scared them and they're, oh, we're going to get eaten. Oh, come on. We have to go. Let's go. Let's go. And yeah. around. <sighs> but I went to, I also went to the back, the back part of Chichen Itza. Okay. Yeah. You talk to your, uh, you know, your wife, did you say? Yeah. Yep. Your wife and then your other friends about the backside of Chichen Itza. Like the, I, I don't even know how to explain that. Like there is a part of Chichen Itza that's not dug up. Yeah. There is a, uh, there is a lot that's not dug yeah. up. Yes. So they told me, uh, no Westerner had stepped foot on that area where I was for 45 years, 45 okay. years. And the pyramids, one of the pyramids I climbed up were, was bigger than the pyramids of, of Giza. Th of, that would be in Teotihuacan in, in, in just outside of Mexico City. It has the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. And it, so it's it, so when I was, I was there seven years ago. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't undug, it wasn't dug up yet. Oh, and okay. When I got oh, to oh, the, oh, but, oh, sorry. So those ones are all excavated, but this one that you're no, talking about is, is okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Four or five pyramids. Still, okay. It was four or five pyramids. So everyone knows Chichen Itza, right? Yeah. Of course. Right? Yes. What yes, they don't is. tell you is 10 miles away mm -hmm. in the jungle is another area of Chichen Itza because the city is that big. Yes. And 
the government doesn't put money into uh, yeah. this area. They put yeah. money into Chichen Itza because it makes them lots of money. But there's, exactly. There's a back area way in the back. So when we pulled up, we got greeted. So I was taken there by a uh, a Mayan shaman, mm -hmm. like a Mayan. Uh, he was very well respected. And when we pulled up, these guys came up with some machine guns. Like they had these machine guns in their hands. And I'm like, nope. I'm thinking, oh my gosh. I'm gonna get <laughs> and they came up and they he asked them told them about what I wanted to do. Yeah. And they said, okay, well, it's going to cost you this much money. And I said, okay. So I gave them some money and they let yeah. me drone. So here we are climbing up. So when you looked at one, the big giant one, half yeah. of it was covered. So it looked like a big mountain, but mm -hmm. there was pieces when you get up close to it that the locals had torn apart. And we climbed up to the top of it. And after I, you know, caught my breath and threw up, no, I didn't really throw up, but I, I was so tired <laughs> climbing yeah. to the top that you overlook and you could see the other pyramids. And then there was an area that we hiked back down and we actually went and explored this little city park. That, and half of it was was still not like when I say dug up, I mean, Mother Nature had grown over it. Yes. And the locals, they were slowly going there on their days off and they were just know with their shovels and they're mm -hmm. you know just unclearing stuff away and they showed me this road that was so straight that if you took a compass and you look straight it would go right to right to Chichen Itza right to the to to the the top of it like right yeah it was perfect and I think what he, they said that if it kept going like the line would go straight to Egypt. That's fascinating. That's and, interesting. And the line would go straight to all these different pyramids around the world. This is what they were telling me. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I have to take their word for it. But if you yeah. saw, so I droned it all, and it was pretty amazing. I, all this drone footage that was at the top of this big pyramid, and it, 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 it's fantastic. You know, like the, the, they talk about how many. Like they say, if you look out in the jungle and you see what could be like a small mountain, they're like, it's not a mountain. That's going to be a pyramid. Yeah, um, It's exactly like you said. They don't have the money to excavate all of these. And my father-in-law, um, he's got some land here. And and like if people don't understand how quickly the jungle grows. So when you go there, when the rainy season starts, I would say vegetation grows minimum an inch a day. Yeah. Minimum an inch yeah. a day. Yeah, it, it, it's it's phenomenal how fast things grow. And it just it, it's crazy to keep on top of that. So, you know, if you're talking hundreds and hundreds of years from these pyramids, like they're just going to get covered. And what gets uncovered, you know, next rainy season is going to start to get, you know, they have to stay on top of it. It's 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 crazy. Do you remember a few years ago when they found all that gold and treasure where they found all that uh, artifacts in that cave? And I, uh, I the don't. Tell me about this. This I don't. This that found it, like the researchers that found it, they didn't want to touch it because the locals said it was if they touched it, they, they would get there was kind like of a curse. curse or there was some something. It was all over the news and everything. That was only a, that was <laughs> that was literally the the day I was on the plane going back to Canada and they okay. found it and it was only a like a, a few miles away from where I was. No way. I, I looking at all the caves, like all the areas in that little area. Um, yeah, and, and and that's a thing as well for people who don't know. There, it is littered with what we call cenotes or like these freshwater caves underneath, and they connect for miles. Yeah, I, I actually jumped into a cenote, which is amazing. Like one that uh, wasn't tur. It wasn't a tourist one. Okay. So it, that, that's, yeah, it, it's, it, it, they are amazing and beautiful. Um, just phenomenal, phenomenal. I remember jumping, jumping down and the bats hitting me. <laughs> really? Going into the, like going down because all the bats were leaving. You definitely were not in a tourist one. That is nope. for sure. I wasn't <laughs> a tourist one. No, I, I, I was so excited to, mm -hmm. you know, 
And I think that was one of the times where I, I saw some of the biggest spiders too, like the big giant. Yeah, there is tarantulas around here as well. You know, tarantulas aren't an uncommon thing and scorpions. Um, yeah, because I, I do live in the Yucatan Peninsula. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so so I'm near uh, Chichen Itza is about three, three hours away from me, I would say. Um, yeah. What's that? Sorry. So I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I know. Have you been to Chichen Itza recently? Uh, the last. Ugh, I have not. So there is a Chichen Itza. There is a sister city of Chichen Itza that is just outside of a city called Merida, and it's about forty minutes at most outside of. I would say maybe actually half hour outside of Merida, and it's it's like the sister city of Chichen Itza. And this one, it's uh, only maybe like ten percent is uncovered. But in this one, you can explore everywhere. Like you can go up onto the pyramids, and you can go and explore yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think the last. The last time I went to Chichen, Chichen Itza, I was kind of disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all kind of blocked off and everything. Everything. You couldn't, yeah. couldn't get close. Uh, but the very first time I ever went to Chichen Itza was, I, I think, 15, 20 years ago, and I was able to climb up to the top. And they were still digging up Chichen Itza at that time. Really? There, yeah. So that was, that was cool to see how rustic it was. And there wasn't as many people. I'd say mm -hmm. when I was there the very first time, maybe a hundred people. And that might sound like a lot of people, but really for how big it was, there was it, times where we couldn't see anyone. It's not. Yeah. When, when I was in Mayapan, um, the sister city there, at most there was eight people. Yeah. So it, 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 was, it, it, was, it was great. Um, now, Chichen Itza is actually, it's a gray area because it is – partially private it's kind of privately owned yeah um the but the they work with the government and that's why when you go in when you call it a tourist trap that's exactly what it is because the person who like the the family that privately owns it they allow all the the hawkers in you know like they sell you all the um the souvenirs what's that sorry two thousand of them yes yep. two thousand booths oh. lines up around it and then you have the little kids that keep coming up and tapping you and wanting you to buy their their fake gold, right? Yeah. So tapping. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I said. You know. <laughs> get away. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and it's because they allow them in because they take a cut of that of that money that goes. Uh, you know, the family takes a cut of the money that uh, the yeah. the hawkers, the souvenir um, sellers, shops uh, make. The first time I was ever there, there was only. 10 or 15 mm -hmm. when i first went i was now, it's exploded it's exploded yeah oh, I, I, when i came, i went back like 10 years later yeah and i was shocked couldn't believe it and the, the crowds of people like yes. i think by by 10 o'clock in the morning there's probably over five thousand people yeah. and by one o'clock it's probably close to ten thousand. like there were just so many i i did attend um what do they call it? Like laser mapping. Um, it was a show at night. I went to Chichen Itza at night. That was actually the last time I'd been there was probably about six or seven years ago, very similar to when you were there. And they did this presentation at night and they, they sold maybe, maybe 200 tickets and they had all these chairs set up and they did this laser show on the pyramid. And so they kind of showed you the history of the pyramid oh, cool. was there before. It was very interesting. That, that is very cool. Well, I know Mexico has their own cryptid. So it would be great to go down and film a searching for Sasquatch. Yes. Uh, and look for those creatures. You know, if you have those connections of, you know, places we can go explore and a translator. I oh, mean, I, I, I have translators. Yeah, we, we, we can uh, we can make this happen. I would love it. I, I could interview you. You can talk about what you do. You can talk about any experiences and. You know, we do the adventure. Have you watched any of my Searching for Sasquatch documents? I have not. I have not yet. You know, it's, uh, but I, I'm going to get on to it. I'm going to get on to it. I, I really like the adventure bit mm -hmm. of, uh, of doing my expeditions. Like when I do my films, yeah. I do, you know, I do, you know, some talking heads, but I really like the, um, the adventure. Okay. Yes, like the 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 nuts and bolts of it. You know, it, it's good to interview people, but actually getting boots on the ground and uh, and getting out there—that's that's the important thing. You know, yeah. and 
and, and, and I want to support everyone who does that as well, because that's something I haven't been able to really do. You know, like like I said, I have my own experiences uh, um, in northern Mexico. You know, that's where I've seen uh, a couple UFOs in Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, cool. it, it, we could combine it. We could combine a search for Sasquatch, you know, at the UFO. You know, if you know people who have seen UFOs or, or maybe some. I, I have I have some good connections. There is a biologist um, who is responsible for. So I don't know him personally, but he's a friend of a friend who was, you know, protecting the, the sea turtles and, you know, allowing them to migrate into into the ocean. Um, or like not migrate, sorry, like, you know, like leave their eggs and, and yeah. head back into, into there. And a friend of a friend uh, was telling me that this individual, he's been doing this now for 15, 20 years, never seen anything. Last year, he saw two USOs, so underwater submerged objects come out of, well, one came out of the ocean and then flew off. And then another one was across the highway and it lifted off out of the jungle and flew off as well. See, that would be, okay, now you really have my interest we're gonna to have to talk after the like on, on another day yes we'll, for sure definitely we'll, and we'll try and make something like that happen i'm very dead serious about doing that that would be pretty epic yeah um, like i i've been i've been talking with a couple of people like i talked i don't know if you know who la marzuli is um he, no. he's, he's on the he is all about the nephilim he's kind of like tracking down the nephilim and um, he was like the Paracas skulls um, as well. He's done a lot of DNA tests on them and um, a lot of research on them. Now, we and him were talking about putting on a, um, a tour down here, you know, we're, because they just put in what's called the train Maya, this train that comes into all these archaeological sites and, and kind of doing something like that. So something we can talk about in the future. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. You know. Um, I also am doing uh, paranormal also. Let's let's that is kind of my I would say that my own experiences, uh, 85 percent of my experiences are all paranormal. So I would love to hear. Uh, tell me about your paranormal experiences. So I have two paranormal adventure um, documentaries out and there's a third one that I just launched. Uh, it should be on. So you can watch all my documentaries on Tubi. Oh, all perfect. Watch on TV. We need to go check that out then. We'll definitely be putting that link down below. Yep. All you have to do is just put in Jason Kenzie into the search bar. Mm -hmm. Or if you just Google Jason Kenzie, Bigfoot or Sasquatch or, you know, you'll find all these crazy stuff that I've done over the years. Not just Bigfoot, but my animal adventures too. So I decided the last paranormal adventure documentary I did I combined Bigfoot with the Poplic Monster. What is so that? I went to the Poplic Monster. So I went to the Poplic Bridge. Okay. So it's a bridge that is ex extremely haunted. It's, um, I don't know if it's, if it's protected, but allegedly there's a goat man creature that oh, okay. basically puts people in a trance and lures them to go up onto this active trestle and then the train comes and either hits them or they fall off and so Whoa. many people have died under the bridge either they've fallen off yeah and so it's so and then many people have seen bigfoot also in the same area so i went to this area with the she squatchers again mm -hmm. and we went into the forest and we were looking for both evidence of the public monster and bigfoot creatures and uh yeah it was quite fascinating we got quite a bit of evps from people okay uh the bait and so that was that was fun then we went to the story inn do you know the story inn i have i do it, not i do it not was an extremely haunted hotel okay very old like like late i think 19 early 1900s like it's just so old uh, i was dur during the civil war and and uh the first nations people were fighting and it was just complete chaos and there was a lot of people that died and a lot of um a lot of people who lived in there um people sometimes people hung themselves but we went to investigate the blue lady 
this lady that was in this blue room. They call it the blue room, and there was this lady that was. So we went there, and we caught some EVPs, and uh, yeah, it was quite quite freaky and a lot of fun. Yeah, I have cool. This, uh, what is your most memorable EVP? If if one pops into your mind of what you caught, what would that be? So the very first documentary I did was you know, um, uh, um, Paranormal Adventures, the first one, and we went into this haunted hospital. And we went into this area that, you know, you basically just have a key and you walk in and no one goes back there. Like no one's been there for, you know, 10 years. And we went back there and I went into the room by myself and I asked, hey, do you know who I am? And I, the female voice comes and says, Jason. So that was freaky. And then another time I actually asked the question, how did he die? And this deep kind of demonic voice comes over the EVP. How did I die? And so we caught that on camera and that was pretty amazing. And then another time I, I was kind of joking around and I said, you know, I said, Hey, uh, do you like being here? Or I was asking questions. I said, I said, wait, I haven't protected myself with the white light. Just give me a second. And I went and did the white light, but we caught an EVP of a guy saying, no, we're not going to, you know, you don't get to protect yourself. So that was, that was a lot of fun. That was, uh, you know, scary, but you know, I've had like, there was, when I was younger, uh, when I was like 17, there was this old house that people used to do devil worshiping and, and, and they used to sacrifice animals in this old, decapitated, uh, yeah, run down, rickety house, window smashed and everything. And when I was a kid, when I was like 16, I went to this, I, I, I went there at night as it was like kind of sunset. And I, I looked in the, the door, opened the door and there was candles all over the ground. And so I looked around and I'm like, and the candles were lit. So being a kid, I, I ran through and I kicked them all down. I was like, bam, bam, bam. I was kicking them as I was running. I was scared. And I ran through and I ran out the other door. And I stopped and I walked back in the, in the door and I looked and the candles were, were up again and still lit. What? It scared the fuck out of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was so terrified. I could not believe it. And I don't usually tell people that story because... People just think it's completely crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I kicked as many candles down. There was probably about, I don't know, 25 candles wow. in the room. Yeah. And they were yeah. all lined up. Yeah. And I ran and I kicked. I didn't kick all the candles down. Yeah. I could only kick. I was just scared. I didn't know if someone was going to come running or, or of, something. Of course, of course. Yeah. You're, I, I completely can relate to that. You know, 16 years old and, you're doing what you can and then you look back and yeah i look back like I, I walked back in a little bit and i was so scared i looked in and the candles i had kicked down they were all up they were still up and it's so funny because i remember when i kicked a few that uh, they broke like the candles broke as i kicked them wow. just, there, there were candles it looked like someone took these white candles and they yeah. they burned the, the bottoms of them and stuck them straight up on the floor okay that's what it looked like yeah they're all lined up and so yeah and just one motion like i wasn't like i was kicking and, and looking and then stopping and look i was yeah. basically kicking really fast and then ran through but yeah that was probably one of the more traumatic stuff when i was a, a child mm. And, uh, I have a story. I have a story to tell you. One of you know, one of these times here, when we talk in the future here, I'll, I'll tell you about my uh, uh, my shadow being uh, when I was about the same age. About I'd say about seventeen. I was about seventeen years old, maybe eighteen. And there's a, a shadow being floating over my bed with red. Well, kind of letting it out right now with red glowing eyes. You know, that was a terrifying experience. Terrifying experience. That would have been terrifying. I I haven't seen red eyes with Bigfoot like with these creatures. Yeah, that, that's one thing, you know, some people talk about. They said this and 
I find it peculiar, you know, like me seeing these red glowing eyes as well. And it's not like they're flashlights, but they're glowing. Yeah. You know, it's 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 like that. And that's what I, I've been told many different times about, like, you know, yellow or orange or red, you know, or even I think I even heard blue. I heard blue as well. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm waiting to see. I mean, I've yes. seen lots of red eyes in the forest, but they usually uh, like a fox. Like okay. Yeah. With the red eyes. I've seen like a, like eye shine a, is, is what you're, what you're seeing the, then. Yeah. Just the eye shine from the, from the flashlight. Yeah. You know, that's the only time I've really seen kind of red eyes, but they weren't completely red. They were like more like the light would catch it and it'd be on yeah. the ground, you know. And but yeah, there's yeah, you're in for a treat if you decide to watch any of the. the I'm going to. I've I've already I actually already signed up to Tubi and I've already searched you. I have it saved here. You know, I'm looking at paranormal adventures, haunted voices, uh, searching for Sasquatch, the she the she squatchers, and paranormal adventures two evil energy. Yeah, I, I I'm going to be. Tonight, uh, that's I'm gonna start watching. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, a lot of fun. You know, you have to do it with the lights off. And you <laughs> have to have popcorn. Just get some popcorn. E exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's a great idea, actually. Um, so I have a question. What you know, other podcasters ask this question too. But what do you think Sasquatch or Bigfoot is? What is your and and there's no wrong answer. It's just you know we're all taking a guess at what we think it is with our from our own experiences. Well, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people and mm -hmm. a lot of people have uh, different opinions for sure. And, you know, sometimes they go with the paranormal where they're, mm -hmm. they get zip in and out of, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like um, Re our reality or a dimension or something like that. You know, yeah. you know I, I think they're flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. I think they are a living being of some kind if they really do exist they they you know i don't th it's it's hard because if they are part alien yeah um then they would have different it just it, it, it i have been in an, in a situation where my the the infrared light on my video camera the creatures or whatever they are that I'm looking at with the eye shine, they seem to be able to step just back, just outside of the, the, oh, the infrared. red light beam. Um, so they can see it is what you're saying. Well, yeah, they can see it or they just Sense know it. how to yeah. step just, just in, so you can't really get to see what they look like. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I do think, I mean, they could be part primate. Mm hmm. Right, they could be, you know, but but yet again, humans are primates, really. True, you know, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. I don't know. I was, uh, on my days off, I do kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I have been around actual, you know, primates. Primates, like like you know, apes and. Mm -hmm. Monkey. Yeah, our our uh, I, I'm not saying primates, but monkey are our neighbors that we live beside for over a year here. Uh, they have a spider monkey, you know, and it would always uh, Cersei. And she would always come over and visit us and annoy our dogs, bug the dogs. What was she friendly? Oh yeah, extremely friendly. Yes. So so you're able to hold her? Um, I never did, but her her mom and dad, you know, as they would dad, yeah, they had her, they had her a diaper on her and everything, you know, and they call her by name and she would come back and yeah. And they still live next to you? Well, we're living with my in-laws and so they still live next to my in-laws. Yeah, they still have Cersei. And they're and how far away are they from you now? Um, if I drove 3 4 minutes? Oh. Oh, they're, they're that that close. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, you know, uh, Jason, I think we definitely need to have some, you know, conversations here in the future and uh, talk about some some uh, some uh, future adventures. You want to see something that I just did not too long ago? I would love to. I made a Searching for Sasquatch comic book. It's a graphic novel. Awesome. Okay, so is, everybody who wants a graphic novel, here we go. Yeah, it's a graphic novel. It's uh called Searching for Sasquatch and the Hidden, and it has uh, researchers, yep. elite researchers that go into the the, the forests, 
Mm -hmm. Looking for evidence of Bigfoot, and they find all this gold. Interesting. I like it. And so there's a, a, a thing among the gold that gives the Bigfoots their power. Of, uh, okay. invisibility, strength, uh, smell, speed. And they thought we were going to try and take it. So they were like fighting us, trying to get rid of us. So I'm in the middle. And that's I, the She Squatchers. Yes. And you, there's uh, Tammy from the She Squatcher hanging upside down. Uh, that's Todd Parsons <laughs> with the hat on. And then cool. this guy here is uh, that's David Dominique. And then this guy is Todd Parsons. I, yeah, I've heard Todd Parsons before. Yes. There's a that that's me. Okay. Well, whoops, whoops, whoops. I look there like you are. <laughs> it, it's, it's that reverse of the camera. I know it's always like, whoops, no. So there's lots of uh, lots of um, action and cool. you can that on Amazon. Definitely. So, you know, at the, uh, you know, Jason, I want you to send me all those links. We'll make sure we put them all in the show notes here. And, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, the Canadians helping Canadians is how we do this, right? That's how we have to do. We have to work together, right? Exactly. Like, exactly. We're going to take over the world. We need to work together. Right? Yeah. One, uh, one poutine at a time. <laughs> exactly. Right. All right, Jason, I want to say thank you so much for showing up and, uh, you know, telling us a, a little, uh, tell us so much, you know, giving us so much information and you're really, you know, you're making a difference out there. Thank you. I'm trying guys. I'm getting close. I think it's only a matter of time before I can get that daytime sighting of, of these creatures. I, I, I think that's going to be awesome. So thank you so much for, uh, for being on Jason. Thank you so much. I'll uh, talk to everyone again shortly. For sure. for sure. All right, everyone. That was Jason Kenzie with, I think he said 13, uh, don't quote me on this one, 13 to 15 documentaries of uh, Searching for Sasquatch. And then he also has his two paranormal adventures as well. Um, and he's working with the C the She Squatchers. That is a bit of a tongue twister that I have a little bit of a problem with. And then he's got his graphic novel as well. And, he, and, and we heard those amazing sounds, those Minnesota, you know, roars, um, I believe is what he called them. And that that is interesting. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. I'd love to hear what you think those are. Um, and we're going to play one before we head out here. You know, um, one last time. Oh, and I messed that up. So let's try that again. Yeah, so... <laughs> All right. And next week, I'm going to have Ron Moorhead on. I've talked with Jason about sharing these with Ron, and uh, we'll get his opinion on them as well. And as the night and as the show is coming to an end, like I always say, keep your curiosity wandering, keep the light lit, and may you always find your way home. forward to our next adventure together as we navigate the mysteries that lie ahead. Until our paths cross again, keep your curiosity wandering and ensure the light remains lit. <laughs>